There was this deadly disease, which you will find no more today. A disease that troubled us for many, many years. It killed so many people. It disabled so many others. There was no cure found. Smallpox, one of the deadliest disease known to mankind. It is also the only human disease to have been completely eradicated by vaccination. Around 30% of the cases used to result in death. Very few survived without scars, blindness, loss of organs like lips, nose and ears. Smallpox harmed populations for thousands of years. Researchers, in fact, who examined the mummy of the Egyptian pharaoh, observed scarring similar to that from smallpox on this person's remains. Ancient Sanskrit medical texts dating from about 1500 BC describe a smallpox-like illness. So it's plagued humans for so long and so intensely. And then there was this curious scientist, Edward Jenner, who found something very interesting. Milkmaids who were exposed to cowpox virus in cows who had cowpox did not develop smallpox. On May 14, 1796, Jenner took fluid from a cowpox blister scratched onto the skin of James Phillips, an eight-year-old boy. A blister rose up on the spot, but James soon recovered. On July 1st, Jenner inoculated this boy again, this time with smallpox matter, and no disease developed. This was the revolution. And this is what we call in modern days a vaccine. And vaccination is when you introduce a weakened microbe or something like a microbe into a healthy person and then protect that person against the real disease. How does this happen? Our body actually has its own personal army which protects it from invaders. We call these harmful invaders, you know, the bad bacteria, virus, fungi, pathogens. So when the pathogen enters our body, our body produces something in return called antibodies, which fight against these pathogens. Now our body's army knows how to fight these guys. And the next time these guys come in, the body's army called the immune system knows exactly where to break the neck of this enemy, what the weakness of this enemy is and how to actually put an end to it. So to make it very, very clear, immunization is what happens in your body after you have had this vaccination. The vaccine stimulates your immune system so that it can recognize the disease and protect you from future infection. Uh, now you are immune to... So Edward Jenner is credited as the person who introduced the first vaccine and his vaccine was a big success. Doctors all over Europe soon adopted Jenner's innovative technique, leading to a drastic decline in new sufferers of this devastating all-world disease. Advancement in research has ensured that now we have vaccine for polio, measles, mumps, rubella and vaccines for these diseases reduce the burden caused by these diseases greatly, increased life expectancy and made people much more healthy. So when you were a baby, you were also vaccinated so that your body actually develops immunity to all these diseases. I hope it's really, really clear what's the difference between vaccination and immunization. In fact, this polio vaccine which I spoke about has saved millions of children from potential infections from this, from this polio virus. Say you do get into trouble after all the vaccinations, you can still take antibiotics. Now, before we had antibiotics, there were very few choices when it came to treating infections. You would wait, see if the infection improved on its own, so just by using time, or you could just cut the infection off. Very, very, very painful. It wasn't, under, it wasn't until 1928 that the first antibiotic was discovered accidentally. When researcher Alexander Fleming came back to work, and after a weekend away from his lab, he found a certain type of mold called Penicillium notatum. And this mold had halted the growth of a bacteria, of a bacteria called Staphylococcus, which caused skin infections, pneumonia, and some you know, foodborne lessons, among other infections, in his 
in his little dish called a petri dish. And not only did this, uh, uh, this mold work on Staphylococcus, it also worked on other bacteria like Streptococcus, meningococcus, and diphtheria bacillus, which also caused severe, you know, very major diseases. So antibiotics work against bacterial infections. Many of us have used them to treat infections from, say, strep throat, bladder infections, skin infections. But you know what? They will not do any good against a viral infection, including cold and cough, influenza, or you know all the other diseases which are caused by viruses. Why? Any particular reason? Can you think of why this can happen? Because unlike human cells or bacteria, viruses don't even contain the chemical machinery which is needed to carry out chemical reactions for life, because of which antibiotics don't work on it. And why does this happen? Because antibiotics work in one of the following ways. One, they interfere with the bacteria's ability to repair its damaged cell parts. Two, they stop the bacteria's ability to make what it needs to grow new cells, that is its genetic material, and virus doesn't have that, right? So it won't work against a virus. And it also weakens the bacteria's cell wall until it actually bursts. Gruesome, but this is how it does. Yeah. Some examples of antibiotics are streptomycin, tetracycline, erythromycin. See, and they don't really work for humans. Antibiotics are even mixed with the feed of livestock and poultry to check micro microbial infection in animals as well. They are also used to control some plant diseases. So antibiotics are kind of a revolution in medicine, right? Now, while we are at antibiotics, there are a couple of things you should keep in mind. One, antibiotics can't really distinguish between good bacteria and bad bacteria. As I mentioned before, there is a delicate balance of billions of bacteria inside your digestive tract. Like Mr. Bacter, the probiotic, and in the large intestine, and then you have acidophilus in the small intestine. So all these guys are the good bacteria, but the antibiotic cannot really distinguish between the two. So if you continue to use these antibiotics beyond the prescription of the doctor, they can seriously disrupt the normal ecology of the body and make someone more susceptible to you know disease-causing bacteria, yeast, and other parasitic infections. So it's very, very important that you take antibiotics in the correct dosage. You don't take too much of it or else it will harm even the good guys who are living in your body and making life for you much, much easier. Then the second thing is the worst thing you can do is to actually take only a few of the antibiotics prescribed. So if you shorten the duration of the antibiotic, you're only wiping out the most weakest of the bacteria, the weakest of the bad bacteria, and you're allowing the stronger ones to survive. So it's a natural feeling that you'll start feeling better, but it's not going to help because if you forget to take your pills or you stop taking them intentionally, thinking that, you know, the infection is gone, hey, I'm feeling better. But the fact is only the weakest bacteria are killed. The stronger ones are still there. The hardier ones are still there. And not only do they survive, since they've already seen this antibiotic once, they remember it. And then they change the structure so that the antibiotic will not affect them or kill them in the future. The third most important thing is that the dosage of the antibiotic is an important factor uh, to ensure that it's really, really effective. Now, if the dosage of the antibiotic is not adequate or enough, it will not be effective for treatment of the infection. And bacteria are more likely to develop something called resistance. Resistance means uh, the next time you give a medicine to it, it won't affect it to be more resistant to that infection. This is because the bacteria can continue to grow and develop ways to disrupt the antibiotics effect. So underline, always remember, follow the dosage prescribed by the doctor. Very, very important when it comes to antibiotics. You cannot self-prescribe antibiotics for yourself. Let us now talk about some common plant diseases. Citrus canker is a disease affecting the citrus species caused by a very exquisite sounding bacterium, Xanthomonas axonthodes. Infection causes cuts on the leaves, stems, fruits of citrus trees, including lime trees, orange trees, and grapefruit. Now, citrus canker causes the citrus tree to continuously decline its fruit production until the tree actually produces no fruit at all. So while it's not harmful to humans, canker, as you can see, significantly affects the health of the citrus trees, calling leaves and fruits to drop before they actually should. It affects all types of citrus and very, very, very contagious. So a fruit infected with citrus is actually safe to eat, but too ugly to be sold. You wouldn't ever want to buy it. My next example, I need a sheaf of wheat. 
is the wheat leaf rust. It affects wheat, barley, rice stems, their leaves and grains. The pathogen is Puccinia rust fungus. Puccinia triticina causes back rust. And then there's another one which causes brown rust. And then there's another one which causes yellow rust. And yellow rust is the most prevalent of the tree. And it occurs in most wheat growing regions. It causes serious epidemics in North America, Mexico, South America. And it is a devastating seasonal disease in India. And wheat is one of our most staple diets. They spread from one plant to the other through spores or in the air. Let me take you to one more example. Bhindi. You all know Bhindi, right? Okra. This leaf may look beautiful, but it's diseased. It is a leaf of the Bhindi or the Okra plant that has been affected with Bhindi yellow vein mosaic. This disease was first reported in Okra plants in 1924 in India and Sri Lanka. The symptoms include alternate green and yellow patches, as you can see, and vein discoloration on the leaves. The yellow network of veins is very, very clear. The vein veinlets are thickened. And in severe cases, it will result in complete yellowing of leaves. So what, what happens? How does it affect us negatively? Fruits will be dwarfed, malformed and yellow green in color, not the bright green color of, you know, lady's finger. The white fly is the insect vector. This white fly vector reproduces, uh, you know, to significant numbers during the summer season when it transmits the virus, this virus between okra plants and causes this devastating disease. So now you know that pathogens can affect all living things, right? human beings, plants, animals, and good microbes as well, like bacteria, which is why we actually need to take a special effort to keep these bad guys far, far, far away from us.